in the house of God this morning. Well, I want to thank you once again for being here today. Amen. We thank God for a powerful time of worship with Miss Morgan this morning. Amen. Amen. To God be all the glory for the blessing and for the gifts that he's giving us in this place. This morning, I want to share with you what the Lord has placed on my heart all week. We began talking about um, crossing over, which we have crossed over, and thank God that we are all here, amen? amen? To God be the glory. Not everybody made it through into this month of October, you know? And so um, we just thank God that he has allowed us to see another month and another year, amen? Um, well, another month in this year of 2019, amen? amen? Now, I don't know if you know, if you've ever noticed in your own lives, like when we come towards the end of the year, there's much warfare that takes place, especially when we start like from September, October, November, and December. There's a lot of times as believers, we go through a lot of warfare, and sometimes you can't even fully understand what it is that is happening unless you understand the times, amen, you understand the season that you are in. So last week we talked about crossing over and I shared with you a prophetic word that the Lord gave and um, I'll just quickly read that prophetic word to you this morning. We've shared it um, with our ministry partners, ministry wide. We've shared this prophetic word also on our social media platforms. But I just want to share with you, this was a word that I sent out on the 30th of October, but the, I had prepared the word prior to that. I just sent it out to our ministry after the message on Sunday. And so this was, it said, as we prepare to cross over into October, so we were still in September, I want to share the prophetic word for the, word, for the month, for the Hebrew month of Tishri, which began today. This was 30th of October. So this word also applies for our crossover on the Gregorian calendar. As we cross over into a new year, which I'm talking about God's calendar, the year 5780. This is also a time of divine transition into the new that God has ordained for us. Now this could be a time when the Lord is calling you into a new venture, such as a new job, a new business, a new career path, a new ministry, or whatever the Spirit of the Lord is leading you into. This is a crucial time to pay attention to what the Lord is saying to you in this hour. Isaiah 43 verse 19 says, I'm doing something brand new, something unheard of. Even now it sprouts and grows and matures. Don't you perceive it? It'll, I'll make a way in the wilderness and open up flowing streams in the desert. And that translation is a passion. And so this is also a time of fulfillment of prophetic promises. Ezekiel 12, 28 says, Therefore say to them, Thus says the Lord God, They shall none of my words be deferred any more, but the word which I have spoken shall be performed, says the Lord God. Isaiah 55, 11 says, So also will be, will be the word that I speak. It does not return to me unfulfilled. My word performs my purpose and fulfills the mission I sent it out to accomplish. In Jeremiah Chapter 1, verse 12, it says, Then said the Lord to me, You have seen well, for I am alert and active, watching over my word to perform it. And so in the case of the children of Israel, when they crossed over into the promised land, the word that the Lord had spoken to Abram was now fulfilled. However, they had to go through a period of transition before they arrived at their destination. In the same way, we have to go through a period of transition until we arrive at the place of promise. Now, trans transition can be uncertain, unsettling, and frustrating, but we all must go through it. It cannot be prayed away, but be encouraged. The Lord will provide everything that you need to make it through to the other side. You just have to trust his process and trust him in the process. Amen. 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 And so this is the word that we have shared widely. Some of the key things that are in that word is that this is a time of transition. And so I've been praying through that, praying about that. And, you know, one of the things that I said here was that this is a time that we need to hear what, is, what God is saying to us in this hour. 
Also that this you know, transition can be uncertain, unsettling, and frustrating, and we all have to go through it at some point or other in our lives. It's not something we can pray away. But be encouraged, the Lord will provide you with everything that you need Amen. to make it through. Amen. Amen. Now, the reason why I shared this word again is because the word that I'm bringing you today, according to what the Lord had you know, put in my heart all week long, is talking about transition, transitioning from one season to another. Just like a woman when she's pregnant, she has you know, the nine months of, you know, carrying that unborn child, but just because the time, her due date has arrived, the time for that baby to be born has, has come, it doesn't necessarily mean that the next minute the baby just pops out, okay? There will be, the baby will come out, but in between that is what we women call labor. It's a time of travailing, it's a very difficult time. You know, um, every woman, regardless of whether you've done natural or you've used, you know, medications, epidurals, it's a very, very difficult time. And it's a time of transition. So the baby goes through and the mother goes through that period of transition before the unborn child is birthed. And so in the same way, when we are leaving one season and getting into the next, there's usually a period of transition. And many of us, during that period, we, we don't recognize that there's a period of transition in between one season and the next. Whenever a prophetic word is released where uh, we are speaking about getting into a new season, we're starting a new season, we all get excited, and rightly so. However, we don't understand what it takes to actually arrive in that new season. Is the truth all right in this place? You see, it's important as believers for us to know these things. It's not just, you know, to make you happy, to make you celebrate. Oh, praise Jesus, I'm leaving this terrible season, this bad season that I've been in, and I'm just jumping into a new season. Things are going to change. And I can assure you there's been many Christians who've been disappointed because once they've entered that new season, that new month where they're expecting and they got this prophetic word, they were believing that things would automatically change, and things didn't change. And now they are wondering, what happened? I thought the word that came forth was that, you know, this is a new season. God is doing a new thing. Things are supposed to be happening. I'm supposed to be seeing new things in my life. What is happening? Well, because they didn't understand that there was that period of transition. Now, the reason why I mentioned, you know, this and why it's interesting and important is because according to, you know, the you know prophets out there, you know, these are... Prophets that are men and women of integrity um, have actually also during the week I've been receiving word from many of them of how God has been speaking about transition and that in this year of 5780 it is a year of transition. So God is not speaking of a day or a month, He's speaking of a year of transition. Now, you know that a year takes 12 months. And so that means it's the whole year where transition is taking place from one place to the next. We see the cycles with the children of Israel, how they left Egypt and they entered into the wilderness. And then before entering into the promised land, there was a period of transition. But what it is as believers we need to understand is what is this period of transition? Because if you can understand it, you'll be able to go through it faster, you know, and you'll be able to arrive on the other side where we all desire to be the promise that God has given us. Amen? Amen. Yeah. And so yesterday, last night, one of my mothers in faith to, uh, sent, I received a tweet that she had sent out. This is from Dr. Billy Brim, and she said, the year beginning with Rosh Hashanah will be a year of transition. Now, this was last night. I got it. And, but the Lord had been speaking to me about it all week long. So it's been a confirmation of what God wants us to do. Now, transition is defined according to what, her, what she got. And I'll tell you what my definitions are as we go forward. But her tweet read, the year beginning with Rosh Hashanah will be a year of transition. Transition is defined as the process or period of changing 
from one state or, uh, or, or condition to another. So it's described as changing from one state or condition to another. Now, what is always important for us as believers, let's turn to 1 Chronicles, the book of 1 Chronicles chapter 12 and verse 32. It's good to get messages that make you feel good, but it's also good to know how to make sure that that word that you've received comes to pass in your life. Amen? Yeah. There's so many believers who've received true prophetic words from true prophets of God, but they've never seen any of those words come to pass in their lives. And why is that? Because they've never known what to do with that prophetic word, whether, you know, they've never known to wage warfare with it. Is supposed to help you in the area of warfare. So in First Chronicles chapter 12, verse 32, the reason I bring this up is because the Bible tells us of a tribe, uh, the sons of Ishaka, who were men who had understanding of the times to know what Israel ought to do. 200 chiefs and all their kingsmen were under their command. So these sons of Ishaka, they were men who had understanding of the times to know what Israel ought to do. So they understood the times. These 200 leaders plus the king's men who were under the sons of Ishakar, they knew the best course for Israel to take at any given time. You see, as a believer in this Christian walk, at any given time, you need to know what are you supposed to be doing at that particular time. Amen. You Amen. need to know. It's not just just living just to, you know, wake up and go to bed and same old same old routine. There's something that must be done every time. You know, you might have your regular routine of waking up, going to work, coming home, doing whatever, and it seems like it's a mundane routine, but spiritually, you must understand the times. If you don't understand the times, you miss what God is doing. And you might still be in an old season that God has even dealt with that and moved on. And you're still stuck in that old season and you're wondering why the new is not coming into your life. Why you are not seeing the new in your life, in your family's life, in your business, in, in your finances, in all those areas. Amen? Amen? And so it's important to understand the times to know what to do. In Ecclesiastes, let's go there, Ecclesiastes chapter 3. The Bible tells us very familiar scripture. Verse 1, it says, To everything there is a season and a time for every matter or purpose under heaven. So there's a season, there's a time for every matter and purpose on, under heaven. So it's important to understand that even in our own personal lives, there is a time, there is a season for things to happen. And then he tells us here, he says, A time to be born. So there's and he lists this out, so I'll tell you. Let's read through it real quickly. A time to be born and a time to die. A time to plant and a time to pluck up what is planted. A time to kill and a time to heal. A time to break down and a time to build up. A time to weep, a time to laugh. A time to mourn and a time to dance. A time to cast away stones and a time to gather stones together. A time to embrace and a time to refrain from embracing. A time to get and a time to lose. A time to keep and a time to cast away. A time to rend and a time to sow. A time to keep silence and a time to speak. A time to love and a time to hate. A time for war and a time for peace. And so up to verse 8. So what this tells us, and I know a lot of times as believers we just read that, oh, there's a time to kill, oh, there's a time to do this. But what this is telling us is, listen, there's seasons for every matter, for every purpose. There are some seasons, there are some things, there's events as well. So like being born is a one-time event. You know, you and I are never going to go back through our mother's wombs to come out again as babies. So there's things in, on this earth that are one-time events such as being born is a one-time event, dying is a one-time event. Very few have actually died, gone to heaven, been, have come back, and then, you know, died again. So very, very few, I mean, literally, you can't even count 10 people who that has happened to. But they are, you know, dying is a one-time event. Then it tells us, you know, there's a time to kill and a time to heal. So healing is not a one-time only event. Healing is a time, you know, it's an event that occurs frequently. It's something that happens a lot, but there's a time for it, okay? There's a time to kill, you know, that could be a one-time event. So as you read them, you'll see where it says a time to break down and a time to build up. Those are 
recurring events, building up and breaking down. This time maybe you need to break down something and then you need to build up something in your own personal life. So again, these are recurring events. Amen? So you'll see there's a time to weep and a time to laugh. So again, these are recurring events, mourning and dancing, recurring events. But there's also times where there's only one-time events that happen in our lives. Now let's go to Philippians chapter 4. Is this helping somebody? Yes. Philippians chapter 4, verse 12 through 13. Apostle Paul said something. He said, I know how to be abased and live humbly in straitened circumstances, and I also know how to enjoy plenty and live in abundance. I have learned in any and all circumstances the secret of facing every situation, whether well-fed or going hungry, having a sufficiency and enough to spare, or going without and being in want. I have strength for all things in Christ who empowers me. I am ready for anything and equal to anything through him who infuses inner strength into me. I am self-sufficient in Christ's sufficiency. In other versions, King James says, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Now, I want you to see something. You know, I read those two verses, but I really wanted you to see something right at the beginning. He says, I know how to. Let's stop there. I know how to. He says, I know how to be abased and to live and live humbly in straightened circumstances. I also know how to enjoy plenty and live in abundance. So that spoke to me a lot this week. I know how to. I know how to live. I know how to do this. Do you know that there are many Christians who don't know how to go from one season to the next season? And that it could be you here sitting here today and you're wondering, well, I've prayed and I've prayed and nothing has happened. I gave seed, nothing has happened. But do you know how to in that season is the question. Do you know what you're supposed to be doing in that season? Do you even understand the season that you're in? You see, with the children of Israel, it's a good example, but also it's not a, you know, when we use it as they all went into the, in the wilderness. Well, they were a collective group going into the wilderness. But you must understand that all of us in this room, we can receive the same prophetic word, but we are all at different stages in our lives. So it doesn't necessarily mean that just because this prophetic word has come for all of us, we will see the same exact manifestation in our lives. Why? Because some will know what to do with that prophetic word. Some will not know what to do in the same room. I always like to use the example of um, this guy, the, you know, the, uh, Amazon CEO, you know, and how he was on a plane. He was on a plane, huge plane, domestic flight here in the U.S. from one city to another. The same flight that had hundreds of other people sitting this in, on the same flight. Yet here's a guy sitting on in one of those same seats that you and I would have been sitting in, and he's getting a download of what he can do to transform books and put them online and all this and all that. Now he has a billion dollar industry richest man in the world. Yet there were others who were on the same flight, who went to sleep, <laughs> snoring, you know, others doing whatever. Why? So just because they were all on the same plane doesn't mean they all came off that plane during that time. They utilized the time in the air wisely. You understand? So it's the same thing with the prophetic word. We all can have the same prophetic word but it doesn't necessarily mean that all of us are going to have the same results. The key is in knowing how to. That's the key. Now, if we all can learn how to in that season and understand that season, then we can start to see a manifestation of that word in our lives. Right now, the word is waiting upon us. God says, my word shall not return unto me void until it produces that which I sent it. So there's words that you may all have received maybe 10 years ago, still waiting to fulfill what God sent it to fulfill. You may have received a word, you know, 15 years ago, and you're sitting here saying, and you've even given up on that word because you believe, well, that word didn't come to pass. I know the prophet said this or this and that, but it's, I've never seen it happen. 
You've given up on it, but the word is waiting. Is waiting on you to do something to understand your season and the time so that it can come and be fulfilled in your life. Amen? Amen. Amen. We've been talking about vision is for an appointed time. You need to understand your vision. God gives you that prophetic word. It gives you the vision. You need to understand at the time when that, that vision must be carried out. Is it now, Lord? You need to be able to hear from God. You know, we mistakenly just celebrate. Yes, hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Praise the Lord. This is my time. This is my season. And you go on about your business. Amen. And as you go on about your business, you forget that you got a prophetic word. And then now you might even be searching for a new word. You know, something new that might make you feel good because right now you're dealing with this hardship in your life. And so you need another prophet who might give you a word that might make you feel really good. That's like prostituting with witch doctors. That's what God called the people. They were harlots. They were committing prostitution. And that's what we want. We want to prostitute with men and women of God. Today I'm here. Let me get a word. Oh, this word is not good enough. Let me go over there. And so you're doing spiritual prostitution. Is the truth all right? It can't be that way. What, what makes you think that there was not enough power in that word that God sent for you that couldn't t turn around your circumstances? It's because you didn't know how. You may have received a word. You know, at times, there are times that I've, I've believed, you know, I've prayed for people who had an altar call, and I've prayed for people, I'm giving them a prophetic word before I could even start. But when, uh, as I'm speaking, while the Lord is telling me, oh, shut that up, well, they pass out. How are you going to hear a prophetic word that you're passing out? You know, <laughs> what's that? How are you going to know what God is saying? I always say, wait, receive the word, and pass out after if you want to. You know? <laughs> but not before you've heard the word, now you're passing out. These are all dramatics that we do in the body of Christ. I don't know to please who. You know, because you should be God pleasers, not people pleasers. You see what I'm saying? So don't do dramatics. Don't do performances just so people can say, oh, you're holy. No, it's not doing you any good. You want to make sure you are God pleasers. So if there's a prophetic word, take it seriously. Write it down. Some people don't even write down a prophetic word. They'll just say, well, you know, they said, they said, who's they? And when did they say it? And when, what were the facts of that particular word that you received? That's why we send it out in writing so you can have it. Some people, I mean, even in our groups here, prayer groups, are say, oh, praise the Lord, hallelujah, thank you, Jesus. I received my word, but what are you doing with it? Have you taken that word from there and said, let me save this word to my phone or to my notebook or whatever, to my file so that I can read it every day and see what God is saying? What is God saying to me in this hour? How do I bring this, you know, because it's not just on God's end to bring it to pass. There's now your part. What's your part in bringing that word to, part, to pass? So Apostle Paul said, I know how to. Let's even forget about the rest of the stuff. He said, I know how to. Amen? Amen. And so... When we read the story of the Israelites, we find that it is characterized by many cycles of fall and renewal. Time and again, they fell into disobedience and then, of course, made restoration. So we know that they were in the wilderness. A wilderness is a place many of us would gladly avoid if given the opportunity. Wilderness is a place of dryness. It's a place of hardship. It's a difficult period in one's life. You know, it, you think of the wilderness, think of a desert. It's dry. There's, you know, brittle trees and things like that. It's a, it's a difficult place. I've been in many a wildernesses. And I'll tell you why. Many of you might be in a wilderness right now. You might, and, and this is the thing, you need to understand the time so you can know whether you're actually in a wilderness or in a transition. A lot of times I've heard believers all the time say, oh, apostle, I'm in a wilderness. But then if you trace back their steps and ask, go deep and find out what it is, 
I discover, oh, you're actually not in the wilderness. You're actually in a transition period. But because they didn't know that that's what it was, they, they believe that everything is a wilderness. You understand? So every time, oh, I'm in a wilderness. Oh, I'm in a wilderness. But you don't, know, you know, the thing about God is <laughs> he never lets us stay in a wilderness for a long, 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 long time, you know, and never getting out. Even the children of Israel got out of the wilderness. Amen? Amen. You're all looking at me like, oh, Jesus. <laughs> Is this helping somebody? Amen. So one of the things you must understand is the wilderness is an unavoidable place. It's unavoidable. It's actually a principle of God. When you read the word of God, you'll find that wilderness is a principle of God. He created us just like in the natural. We have different seasons. We have here, we have winter, you know, spring, we have summer, we have fall. Well, just like we have these natural seasons, well, God created us to move through spiritual seasons. And, you know, in, in some of those seasons are spent in the wilderness. So wilderness occurs in one of three ways. Number one, we enter through obedience to God's leading. In the case of Jesus, after the, you know, you can look up Matthew chapter 4, verse 1, Mark chapter 1, verse 12 through 13, and Luke chapter 4, verse 1 and 2. Look up the Gospels and you'll see that after, you know, Jesus was baptized, the Holy Spirit immediately took him into the wilderness, led him into the wilderness. Amen? Amen. You know, we are told that he was led by the Holy Spirit into the wilderness. I'll just read Mark chapter uh, not Mark chapter 1 and verse 12 and 13. And it tells us here, and there came a voice out from the, from within heaven, you are my beloved son, in you I'm well pleased this verse 11. Verse 12 immediately the Holy Spirit from within drove him out into the wilderness, the desert, and he stayed in the wilderness 40 days, being tempted all the while by Satan. And he was with the wild beasts, and the angels ministered to him continually. So he entered into the wilderness through God's obedience or through God's leading. Another reason we can enter into the wilderness is as a result of sin in our lives. We look at the children of Israel. They entered into the wilderness out of obedience to God when they left Egypt. It was out of obedience to God, but while they were in the wilderness, they sinned grievously against the Lord God. And therefore God promised to purge that entire generation um, out from before they could even enter into the promised land. Why? Because while they were in the wilderness, they sinned grievously unto the Lord. And so we see that they wandered in the wilderness for 40 years. You see, oftentimes God has to purge some sin issues out of our lives, from our lives, before we can actually enter into the fullness of the promises that he has given us. And we don't like to think about that. We don't like to think that there could be things in our lives that are hindering that word from manifesting. You know, and we wonder, well, that prophetic word came, or I received this, you know, rhema word from the Lord, and how come it hasn't manifested yet in my life? Because sometimes there could be these things, the sin blockers, you know, the blessing blockers, the sin. Sin is a blessing blocker, and it can be blocking. And it could be sin of disobedience, you disobeying what the Lord told you to do. You know, and a lot of believers are in that particular area of disobeying the Lord. The Lord has said, do this, you've disobeyed. The Lord has said, pay tithes and offerings, you've disobeyed. The Lord has said, do ABC, you've disobeyed. You see, so sin can cause us to also enter into a wilderness season. Another reason why we can enter into a wilderness, wilderness season is also by being thrust into it uh, through circumstances beyond our control. This was the case with Job. So if you recall, Job was the richest man in the East. The Bible tells us in Job chapter 1 that he shunned evil, he feared God, you know, he loved the Lord, he feared the Lord, and he shunned evil. And so God had made him rich. There was a hedge of protection around him. He was so blessed that he now, uh, you know, would his kids 
would celebrate birthdays, and each time they would have their birthday celebrations, they would have a party, and each one would go to each one's house to celebrate. And so Job thought that they would sin, or they had sinned. So each time after the celebration, Job would offer an offering and sacrifice to God for their sins in case they sinned. So he actually made himself a target to Satan because Satan was looking for that. In Job 3.25, he actually says, for the thing which I feared the most has come upon me. So he opened the door to fear. Fear is a spirit. And fear created that atmosphere around Job or fear in him made him a target, a Satan's target. And so when now the angels are presenting themselves before the Lord, Satan is coming, he's with them. And the Lord is asking him, where have you come from? What is, where, where have you been? What have you been up to? He says, from going up and down on the earth to and fro. And so God now says, you see, Satan did bring up Job, but he was a target, you know. But he hadn't done anything yet outside of fear for him to be able to attack him. And he couldn't attack him because the hedge of protection was around him. And so now God says to him, have you considered my servant Job? There's no one like him, a man who fears God and he shuns evil. And Satan says, well, isn't it because you've put a hedge of protection around him? If you don't, if you take that hedge of protection, watch and see how he'll curse you to your face and stop serving you. So now Satan is challenging God as concerns to Job. And now Satan and God now says, okay, okay. You see, Job is not there, but he's made himself a target through fear. And so he then says, the Lord says, okay, I'll, I'll remove the hedge of protection that surrounds him, but just don't touch him. You can touch everything that he owns, but not him. And so then the attack Satan went into full force and attacked Job. But what do you call that? Do you say, oh, God did a bad thing? No, that was a test. He was being tested. Because now Satan challenged God and said, there's no way he'll continue to serve you and shun evil if you were to take that around, that hedge of protection. It's because you've blessed him and you know you've prospered him and you re you've got this hedge protecting him. But if you remove it, I guarantee you, he'll stop serving you. He will stop, he, he'll curse you to your face. And so it was a test. When God said, okay, he was allowing that test. You remember Peter, Jesus came up to Peter and said, just before his crucifixion, he says, Peter, Satan has been asking excessively of you that he wants to sift you like wheat. That was he wants to test you like wheat. And Jesus says, I have prayed that your faith will not fail. He didn't pray that you would take him away from that time of testing. We want, oh, pray for this period of testing to go away. I don't want it. But Jesus said, no, I pray that your faith fails not. It's a test of your faith. If you're going to go from one level of faith to the next level of faith, well, how do you think you'll go to the next level? It's just like in school. You know, I, I went to a British system high school where before you could go to the next grade, I don't know here in the high school systems, I can't remember, I think my kids just were going, I mean, I guess you pass, you just go through. But um, in our systems, the British system, you had to actually pass the final exam before you could be promoted to the next class. And so there was always like midterm exams and there's finals. If you did pass those exams, you were held back. So it's the same thing with spiritual stuff. If you are not passing your spiritual exams, you can't just keep going, oh, I'm going to another level, level, level. And you sing those songs. You know, you can sing all the songs you want. But if you are not passing the exam on that level, you won't get to that next level. You have to be kept back. And so what do you think that season when you're kept back is? That's a wilderness. Do you understand that? Yes. So you need to pass. I want all of you to pass. <laughs> pass so you can go to the next level. Amen. Amen. 
And so this is exactly what Jesus said to Peter. He said, I'm praying that your faith fail not. So this is what happened to Job. Job entered into a wilderness season by being thrust into it beyond circumstances, through circumstances beyond his control. He experienced, we know, you know, his testing was over a period of nine months. You know, and so some of us, one day, one week, oh, Lord Jesus, oh, Lord, deliver me from this, oh, Lord. Oh, I can't take it another day. Just one week. Can you imagine nine months of testing? That's what Job went through. And some of us, we haven't even experienced what Job went through. Loss of everything. Today, you get news, oh, yo, these children have died here. Oh, no, your cattle has died there. Oh, your business is going down. Oh, everything. Everything, to the point where his wife was like, just curse God and die. You see? But Job did not do that. He went through a period of nine months as, as a result of being tested by God. Another way we enter into the wilderness season is as a result of our faith being tested. Because Satan may have gone out and ask Jesus, I want to sift them like wheat. <laughs> Every day they're like, oh Lord, I can do what you want me to do, Lord. Use me, Lord. Okay, the test comes. In, in the book of James chapter 1, and verse 2 through 4, it says, Consider it wholly joyful, my brethren, whenever you're enveloped in or encounter trials of any sort or fall into various temptations, be assured and understand that the trial and proving of your faith bring out endurance and steadfastness and patience. But let endurance and steadfastness and patience have full play and do a thorough work so that you may be people perfectly and fully developed with no defects lacking in nothing. Did you hear that? Amen. So our test, there's a test of faith that usually comes about. Many times you may not want it. It's not that, you know, it's part of the seasons of life. Amen? I'll read it to you in the, in the Passion Translation. It says, My fellow believers, when it seems as though you are facing nothing but difficulties, see it as an invaluable opportunity to experience the greatest joy that you can. For you know that when your faith is tested, it stirs up power within you to endure all things. And then as your endurance grows even stronger, it will release perfection into every part of your being until there's nothing missing and nothing lacking. So that could be a season that you're in. Or you've, you're, you may have been in that type of a wilderness season. Amen? Amen. So how do we respond in the wilderness season? Because the way we respond during the season of wilderness is what determines what our next season will be. Like I said, if in, you know, in school, if you did not pass you know, that, that grade that you were in, if you didn't pass the finals, you were not being moved up or promoted to the next, you know, um, to the next class. And so every time when you finish school, you wrote, you finished your final exams, all of us kids would be anxious, waiting to hear results. The results, because that would determine your next season. It would determine whether you're going up, you're being promoted with your friends, you're going into a new class, or you are going to be held back and you are going to now join the class that was behind you. It would determine your next season. Amen? Amen. In Numbers chapter 20, verse 7 through 12, we see that God gave Moses an instruction. So let me quickly take you there. Numbers chapter 20, verse 7 through 12, and I'll read it real quickly. Is this helping somebody? Amen. And the Lord said to Moses, Take the rod and assemble the congregation, you and Aaron your brother, and tell the rock before their eyes to give forth its water, and you shall bring forth to them water out of the rock, so you shall give the congregation and their livestock, livestock drink. So Moses took the rod from before the Lord as he commanded him. And Moses and Aaron assembled the congregation before the rock, and Moses said to them, Here now, you rebels, must we bring you water out of this rock? 
And Moses lifted up his hand, and with his rod he smote the rock twice, and the water came out abundantly, and the congregation drank and their livestock. And the Lord said to Moses and Aaron, Because you did not believe in, rely on, cling to me, to sanctify me in the eyes of the Israelites, you therefore shall not bring this congregation into the land which I have given them. So we see that if Moses had not disobeyed God in this one thing over here, then he would have actually been allowed to enter into the promised land. But because of his disobedience, he didn't do exactly as God told him to do. And because of that, now he was forbidden to enter into the promised land. In the book of Job 42, verse 12, we see that Job, the Lord spoke to Job, and he actually doubled what Job had lost. The Bible tells us that God gave Job, Job 42, verse 12, the Bible says that the Lord blessed the latter days of Job more than his beginning, for he had 14,000 sheep, 6,000 camels, 1,000 yoke of oxen, and 1,000 female donkeys. Well, if Job had given in to grief and cursed God during those nine months of testing, he would never have come into this renewed blessing that we see here in verse 12. You know, people think, oh, it's because Job prayed for his friends. That's why God blessed him. So let me pray for my friends and let me see the double blessings. Well, how many times have we tried that and you haven't seen the double blessings? It's not because Job prayed for his friends that he was blessed. It is because God, Job obeyed God throughout. He never cursed God. He never allowed the grief of the wilderness to overcome him or overtake him. And Amen. And so God showered blessings upon him. Otherwise, had he cursed God, he would have died a bitter man because none of these blessings would have come. Now, the biggest thing, if Jesus had yielded to Satan's temptations after he came out of the 40 days of being in the wilderness, you know, where we know he fasted, and he come out, the Bible tells us that he was hungry when he came out. Now, you know how you are when you're hungry, even without fasting. When you're hungry, you just want to eat. You know, and so anything that is speaking to you, any food that is calling your name, you'll grab it and eat it because you're hungry. Amen? Amen. Well, Jesus is hungry. He's gone without food for 40 days. He's, drink, he's been drinking water, but no food for 40 days. He comes out, and the first thing that happens is Satan shows up and begins to tempt him. And he's tempting him food. He's tempting him with the world, wealth of the world. He's tempting him. Until Jesus, you know, Jesus was strong, he responded, it is written, it is written, it is written the entire time. But he was hungry when he says, oh, you just turn these stones into loaves of bread. He could have been tempted. Oh, yeah, you know, I've been gone without food for 40 days. Amen? Amen. However, he didn't do that. Why? Because if Jesus had yielded to Satan's temptations, not only would he have missed his own destiny, but you and I would have missed our only means of redemption. We would have missed our only means of redemption. Amen? Amen? So that's why it is important to participate with God's plan. His way of doing and being right. In um, Matthew 6.33, he says, Seek ye first the kingdom of God. And Jesus uses the kingdom of God. He references that many times. So it's important for you to know what the kingdom of God is. But then he said, in the kingdom of God, seeking God in his kingdom, meaning seeking his ways of doing and his ways of being. You know, as we seek his ways of doing, there's a process in what God does. So we seek his process of doing things. That is what will enable us to enter into our next season. The one season that he has ordained for us at this particular time in our lives. However, most often we're so overcome by grief that it, whilst you're in the wilderness season, that you simply cannot move forward. You are stuck there. And people say to me, oh, I feel stagnant. It's because of the hardship during the wilderness season. And so now they don't know how to move forward. Amen? Amen. In Psalm of Solomon, chapter 3, verse 6, the Bible tells us that it's the little foxes, the little foxes that, you know, actually this one, it's not talking about the little foxes. Song of Solomon 3, verse 6, it, it says something that's interesting that I like. He says, who or what is this, she asked, that comes gliding out of the wilderness like stately pillars of smoke, 
perfumed with myrrh, frankincense, and all that fragrant powders of the merchant. What I like is, who or what is this, she asked, that comes gliding out of the wilderness. So there is a time to come out of the wilderness. There's a time to glide out of that wilderness. Hallelujah. Amen. Amen. That should make you celebrate. There's a time to come out of that wilderness. Amen. You're not going to be there forever. Amen. You may glide out. You may roll out. You may come up out on top or come out around the side or at the bottom. But you're coming out. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. God is bringing you out. If you've been in a wilderness season, God is bringing you out. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. He said, it is. He said, who is that that is gliding out? So begin to glide on and glide out of that season. Hallelujah. Amen. So God has a time for us to come out, out of the wilderness into a transition on our way to the destiny that he has ordained for us. But like the wilderness season, the season of transition is another place that many of us would really love to avoid if we could avoid it. In fact, because of this season, many people, believers, never move into all that God has for them. God has all these promises for us. God has given you specific prophetic words, and you know this is this is what I'm waiting for, this is what I've been believing you, God, for, and you've even received confirmation after confirmation after confirmation. This was God speaking, but you never see the that word manifest in your life. You never find yourself in that place. Why? Because of this transition period. Amen. 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 Yet, it is the transition season that moves us from the wilderness into a place of restoration. In the wilderness, you may have lost things. You may have, you know, just like Job was in a wilderness for nine months. He lost and everything. But then there's the transition that moves us into God's restoration. But like I said, transition is usually the most difficult of all seasons. Because transition, which means crossing over into a new place or passing from one condition to another, you know, means that we often have to travel through a narrow place as we venture through this process. It's a narrow place. It's not as wide as the wilderness. It's a narrow place. Amen? Amen. So the narrow place is where the path we're used to walking suddenly becomes more confined and precarious you know, much like, you know, crossing over a deep ravine, it becomes smaller. Amen? Amen? During these confining times, we commonly find ourselves under the Lord's scrutiny in the period of transition. But God always has a purpose when we are in a season of transition. You see, he tests us in the difficult places so that he can trust us with new stewardship in the new season. You understand that? Yes. In Luke chapter 18, there's a story told of a young man. He was a rich young ruler. He comes to Jesus. Luke chapter 18, and you can write it down from verse 18 through 26. I'll just paraphrase it. And so this young ruler, he asked the Lord what he should do to inherit eternal life. And the young ruler was so religious. He was a religious young man who was genuinely seeking the right path. He genuinely wanted the right path. Yet when Jesus told him, I like what Jesus told him after, you know, he had said to the master, he said, what do I need to do, Lord, so that I can, you know, I can, I can gain eternal, or inherit eternal life. He told him, Jesus said, you know, you know the commandments, don't commit adultery, don't kill, don't steal, don't witness falsely, honor your father and your mother and all that. And then he replied, all these things I've kept from my youth. But verse 22, and Jesus, when, and when Jesus heard it, he said to him, one thing you still lack. One thing. So there was one thing this guy was lacking that was standing in between him and him you know, inheriting eternal life. He says, one thing you still lack. Sell everything that you have and divide the money among the poor and you'll have rich treasures in heaven and come back and follow me. Become my disciple. Join my party and accompany me. 
Okay, so here it is. This guy, he's being told it's the one thing. Could it be that right now in your life there's one thing that's hindering you from entering into the place of promise that God has spoken to you? Maybe there's one thing that you lack like this man. And so Jesus tells him to, to, sell, to, to seek, to sell his stuff and follow him. Jesus was giving him the narrow path, selling all that he had in order to follow him. Well, the young man went away sad. He could not do it. And he left Jesus without receiving eternal life. And then we see what Jesus declared. Well, you know, verse 23 tells us, but when he heard this, he became distressed and very sorrowful, for he was rich, exceedingly so. 24, Jesus observing him said how difficult it is for those who have wealth to enter the kingdom of God. For it is easier for a camel to enter through a needle a needle's eye than for a rich man to enter the kingdom of God. Now, let me correct something here. There's some people who say, hey, but Jesus said, as Christians, as believers, we're not supposed to be wealthy. Why would God say in Deuteronomy 18, verse 8, uh, Deuteronomy 8, verse 18, that it is I who gives you power, the ability to get wealth? So that, so God wants us to be wealthy. Why would he say in 3 John 2, Beloved, I wish above all things that you may prosper and be in health, even as thy soul prospers. Amen. God wants us to prosper in every area of our lives. It's not that God doesn't want us to have wealth. He desires that we have wealth. But it has to be wealth with a purpose. Not wealth for just squandering and squandering on worldly desires. Wealth with a purpose. The purpose must be for kingdom. The wealth is for the kingdom. Yes, you will use some of it for you and your little kingdom, but the rest of it must be to support the gospel, to support the work of the kingdom of God. Are you hearing what I'm saying? Yes. So Jesus didn't say that people shouldn't be wealthy, then you won't enter the kingdom of heaven. No, God desires that we be wealthy. That's why he said he took on poverty, Jesus, so that you and I might become rich. Why would he take on poverty when he was walking on this earth so that you and I might become rich? And Jesus wasn't poor. He just took on that spirit of poverty in exchange for us, his grace upon us to cause us to become wealthy. That's why he said, let the poor say I'm rich. Do you think if you go to a poor person right now in some deep village, they have no food to eat, and you are there offering them, you know, you're offering them the word of God. They'll look at you and say, what is this word going to do for me if it can't feed me and my children? But if you have money and you buy food and you go to that same village where the people are poor and you feed them with food first and their stomachs are filled, then you now present the word of God to them. Don't you think they'll accept it better? Right. Yeah. So that's what I'm saying. Jesus, the, the, what he was saying here is for those, remember I said the guy was religious. That's why Jesus was inviting him to follow him, to join him, to become his party. Because he wasn't yet part of Jesus' party. He was a worldly young ruler who had so much wealth. But for him, he thought that parting with that worldly wealth, he didn't think that Jesus could give him back the wealth. He didn't know that he would gain more. And so don't be moved by worldly wealth. But Jesus did say nobody will enter the kingdom because they are wealthy. In fact, we are a poor representation of him if we don't have wealth. Are you hearing what I'm telling you? Yes. If we are living under what God has proposed for us in his word, we are a poor representation. We are poor witnesses. Do you think that a person who is born again, filled with the Holy Ghost, and it's raining out there and they're standing at the bus stop with a broken umbrella and you know and somebody passes by with this two hundred and fifty thousand dollar ferrari and stops and you get in there they want to give you a ride because they feel sorry for you and you're saying my brother i need to you know lead you to christ you think he'll listen to you <laughs> he just picked you up uh, from a bus stop with a broken umbrella and you are going to lead him to Christ, and you're going to say, this life, that's a poor representation. But if the tables are reversed, now nothing wrong with if you're taking a bus, 
you are going somewhere to the to to your next season of where you either get a car or get blessed with a car there's nothing wrong with that be in the place that you are right now don't rush don't try to be like the joneses because the joneses are sleeping at night you know you might not be sleeping because you're in debt you know and every time a tow truck or something passes by you're running oh living in fear every day so no live in the place where you are right now where god has blessed you Knowing that you're going, your next season is taking you upward and upward. Are you hearing what I'm saying? Amen. Now, using that example, if that man, let's say that gentleman, you know, in the Ferrari, you know, if you were the one with the Ferrari, you know, picking him up and telling him, he, he, if that person is asking you, how did you come about all this wealth? And you say, oh, let me tell you, I gave my life to Jesus Christ and the Lord has blessed me with all this. He's given me abilities to create wealth. He's shown me what I need to do to create wealth. Don't you think that person will want the Jesus that you're following? Amen. Right. Mm -hmm. So the roles need to be reversed. Are you here? So yes, God wants us to be wealthy. He wants us to prosper. Not just wealth for just spending, but wealth for kingdom purposes. Amen. Amen. So Jesus here, let's quickly conclude with this story. Jesus here is declaring to this young man, he's saying to the disciples that it will be difficult for those with, you know, to, with wealth, meaning worldly wealth, to, co to go through the eye. He says, actually, for it is easier for a camel to enter through the needle's eye than for a rich man to enter the kingdom of God. Now, um, this uh, eye of a needle is actually a particular narrow opening in the wall near one of the main gates in Jerusalem. A camel could not get through the opening by, you know, if, in all, if the only way it could get through that opening is by being stripped of all it carried, dropping to its knees and remaining on its knees to literally crawl through that opening. And so this young man refused to be stripped of all that he had in order to go through the narrow place that led to eternal life. Yet, if we are to get through the narrow place successfully, we must unload what we are carrying, including the weights of the past. Some of you have got excess baggage from the past. You're bringing it into your future. You want to take it with you into the new season. All these suitcases, you know, that's why at the airports when you're traveling international, they charge you so much money, you know, for those excess baggages because it's too much. And spiritually, we have, we're carrying suitcases and suitcases. Some we brought from donkey years ago. Some we brought them from Africa. Some we brought them from wherever. And we are still carrying those suitcases. And each season, God is, you know, wanting to take us in, but we are trying to pull the luggage behind us. Come on, I have these things that I can't leave behind. Do you know what those weights are? Those mindsets from the past. That's why God says, forget about the things of the past. Amen? Amen. Amen. You know, um, during the narrow place of the transition, the Lord often redefines and adjust whatever rules are necessary for us to get to our new place. Um, a good example of this is when Moses died and the mantle of authority was passed on from, you know, Moses to Joshua. Up to that point in the journey, the Israelites, I said last week, had learned to follow a pillar of cloud by day and a pillar of, cloud, uh, a pillar of sun by night or fire by night. And now the Lord tells them to change their, you know, he, 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 he commands them to follow the ark and the ark was a small box that was in front of them. That was such a shift. God needed them to shift. Some of you right now, you're in a place of shifting. God is shifting you. With the children of Israel, it was their vision that was literally, you know, it literally had to change from seeing the large moving pillars in the sky to focusing on a small box that was carried far ahead of them on the shoulders of the priests. It was on their shoulders. And so they had to shift their vision, change their focus. Amen. They had to become more focused in their place of transition. So a lot of times in our own places of transition, we must become much more focused on the Lord in order to make it through to the place of restoration that God has for us. Amen. Amen. And so there are some ways. And I'll close with this verse uh, with this verse right now. Let's go to Hebrews chapter 12. 
And we'll pick up from Hebrews chapter 12 next week by God's grace. Is this helping somebody? Because this is just part one of this message. You know, when I teach, I like to teach. Because we need to know, to know how. Amen. We should be able to say, like Apostle Paul said, I know how to. You know, and you can also, once you learn this, remember Jesus said to Peter, he said, Peter, Satan has asked excessively of you that he may sift you as wheat. And I have prayed that your faith will not fail. So that when you come out of this time of testing, now you can strengthen your brethren. That's what Jesus said. Amen. And so it's important that you and I learn in these seasons of transition, whether you're in a wilderness getting into trans in, in the season of transition, or whether you're in the season like this year for the church, the body of Christ in God's calendar, it is the year of transition. We need to know in this year what is God desiring us to do. There's a shift. There are things that we might have to change in our lives. There's situations. Maybe there's, you know, and sometimes the shift is not something major. Mostly it's obedience versus disobedience. God desires obedience from us. So has there been something that God told you in your last season that you needed to do and you haven't done it yet? Is God speaking to you now about doing something? You know, before we crossed over, God had given me, showed me a vision. It was, this one was more like a dream. And I was in, you know, in a place, and I'm not going to go into all the details of what he showed me. And I remember sharing that with my husband. And of course, he's like, well, you're the apostle, pray. You know, I knew I was going to pray, but then I was just like, it just doesn't make sense. that this dream is so weird, you know, and I... And so I began to pray, and I'm like, Lord, I need understanding. What does this mean? What are you saying? And so the Lord took me through that, that and I was fasting and praying, and I said, I need to have understanding. What does this mean? Because, you know, I'm not the type that everything that I dream that is not pleasant, oh, I pray that away in the name of Jesus. I cancel it in Jesus' name. You don't know. It might be God showing you something for you to adjust something in some area. So it's not everything that you need to cancel. Amen. But understand. But I wrote it down and I said, Lord, I need understanding. And so I began to pray and the Holy Spirit started to show me what that meant. And I was like, oh my God. It was an adjustment to something that he needed me to do pertaining to the work that I'm doing. All I had to do is shift and shift my way of thinking. You know, because all along I had been saying one certain thing and the Lord started to show me. Now I've taken you, I've moved you into this season and in this season I don't want you to be saying that because when you're saying that it's canceling out everything that I'm doing which is ahead of you you see what I'm saying but I got that through the vision that the Lord showed me and me praying to saying Lord I need understanding and so here in Hebrews we'll close here Hebrews 12 verse 1 um, two, it says, therefore then, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses who have become testimony to the truth, let us strip off, throw aside every encumbrance, unnecessary weight, and that sin which so readily, deftly, and cleverly clings to and entangles us. And let us run with patient endurance and steady and active persistence and appointed course, the appointed course of the race that is set before us. Looking away from all that will distract to Jesus, who is the leader and the source of our faith, giving the first incentive for our belief, and, and is also its finisher, bringing it to maturity and perfection. He, for the joy of obtaining the prize that was set before him, endured the cross, despising and ignoring the shame, and, now, and is now seated at the right hand of the throne of God. Amen? So let us get rid of these things. This is what it's telling us. Then let me read that same verse real quickly in, um, in the Passion. But it's telling us we need to strip off and throw a necessary weight sin which so readily and easily clings to us. Here it says, as for us, we, all, we have all these great witnesses who encircle us like clouds. So we must let go of every wound that has pierced us and the sin we so easily fall into. Then we'll be able to run life's marathon race with passion and determination for the pain has already been marked out before us we look at we look away from the natural realm and we fasten our gaze onto Jesus who birthed faith within us and who leads us forward into faith's perfection 
So the other verse I want to close with here in Hebrews, and we'll pick up from here next week, is verse 14. It then says, strive to live in peace with everybody and pursue that consecration and holiness without which no one will ever see the Lord. He says, strive to live in peace with everyone. Here we were told, let's get rid of that wound. Let's get rid of that unnecessary weight. Do you know that unforgiveness, bitterness, anger, jealousy, envy, those are weights that can hinder you from propelling forward or moving into the place that God has for you. If you have unforgiveness, you'll be stagnant. If you have bitterness in your heart, you'll be stagnant. If you are holding on to anger and resentment toward others, even though you don't speak to them, you don't get to see them, but you're holding on to that unforgiveness, to that anger, to that you know, resentment, whatever hurt that they brought to your life, they've damaged you, they've gone out and maligned your name, and you know, they've done all these things, evil things to you. Regardless of what they've done, the Bible tells us to love your enemies and pray for them. If you don't, it'll block you, it'll keep you, because those are sins, and, and it'll hinder you. Yes, much more the sin of disobedience, but when God, when Jesus says, forgive one another, and you're holding on to that for unforgiveness, you're disobeying a command of the Lord. When he says, let go of that anger, no matter what they did to you. Oh, apostle, you just don't know. I can't forget what they did. I'm not asking you to forget. I said, forgive. You know, because that's what the Bible says. What you do with your thoughts is your own time, in your own time. But the Bible says forgive. Even Jesus said in Mark eleven twenty five, 25, when you have brought your gift, if you have ought against any, leave your gift at the altar, go back and make amends with the person who hurt you or who did whatever to you, then come back and present it. Why? Because if there's unforgiveness in your life, your offerings are blocked. If there's anger, hurt, whatever, whatever you're offering to God is not reaching heaven, it's blocked because sin blocks that. And so here in the wilderness, in the transition season, God is giving us an opportunity to make things right with him, to pursue holiness. We'll talk about that next week. We think, you know, we're still talking about transition. So we need to make things right, not only with God, because you don't want to be thrust back into a wilderness season. In as much as transition is difficult, the wilderness is much more difficult. You know, it's difficult if you go back the same cycle, going back into the same place that you just came out of. And you're thinking, but Lord, I just came out of this. I was just experiencing this. Or last year at this same time, I experienced this same exact thing and now I'm back at it. Why is it September, October, November, December, I'm always going through the same thing? Uh, that's a sign that there's a problem spiritually, that you need to take care of that problem. Ask the Holy Spirit to say, Lord, what is it that I have done? Have I disobeyed in any way? Am I holding on to any sin that might be blocking? Because let me tell you, God loves you all. He loves all of us. He does not want to withhold anything from us. In fact, in Psalm 84, 11, he says, No good thing will he withhold from those who are walking uprightly. Why is it in one area you're walking uprightly, but then there's these excess baggage that you're carrying? The weights, the unforgiveness, the not letting go of the past. Oh, there's this wound. If you mention that person's name, it just opens up this wound in my heart. Let's sew it up so that it never opens again. Are you understanding? Mm -hmm. Because that thing keeps on reinfecting and reinfecting, but it's blocking you from moving forward, people of God. And God's desire, my desire too, is that you know how to get out of that place so that you can move into the fullness of what God has for you. Has this helped somebody yeah. today? Yeah. Amen. Amen. Praise God. Well, it's time for our, us to receive our tithes and our offerings today. And Ms. Morgan is going to lead us in a song. Amen? Amen. Praise God.